start is Psalm 139 if you have a Bible. This is the same psalm we started out with on Sunday morning if you were here. We're going to go in a little bit different direction. Psalm 139 verse 1, David says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. Now, tonight I want to talk to you about our very personal Lord. And I think we know this, and if it's completely lost on you, then just figure it's for somebody else. But there's, there's a balance. We need the corporate anointing, and we need to get together. Isn't it good to get together? It's wonderful to get together. And at the same time, we have to remember that he is so personally interested in us. It doesn't say, Lord, you've searched us and known us. David said, you search me. You say, what is the point? Nobody in the universe, including you, takes this personal interest in your thoughts, and your mental and emotional well-being is the Lord himself. Say this with me. He's personally interested in me. And you say, where are we going with this? Well, I'm going to show you that we have to reciprocate and just be personally interested in him. It's good to serve him as a group. I know when I was a young person, we get, I mean, it was like you guys. We were somewhere as a group every single night of the week. We were so on fire for God. And we said, I had to pull back and remember sometimes, this is one-on-one -on -one between me and Jesus. Verse 3. You scrutinize my path and my lying down, and you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. He knows your thoughts better than you know your thoughts. That's true. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, and I cannot attain to it. You ever feel like you might be a little bit boring or have a boring life? Now, you don't have to say that, but I mean, you wonder in a while you can think that God doesn't think you're boring. He thinks you're fascinating. And you say, prove it. I just did. I read what David said. You know my, in verse 4, you know my words before I speak. And you would close me behind and before. Can you imagine how fascinated God is with you? You know why? Because he's in love with you. Now, the truth is, the Lord is more concerned about the thoughts of our hearts and the details of our lives than we are ourselves. He's acquainted with and interested in every little matter of our lives, everything that affects us. Now, there is a belief system called theism, which Thomas Jefferson and others of the founding fathers espoused. Theism says that there is an impersonal, disinterested God who created the universe and spun the world off. That person, or that Entity, whoever he is, may monitor it remotely. They don't believe in a personal God. But basically, that entity has no concern for his creation. And I'm here to tell you that nothing in the world could be further than from biblical Christianity. Now, if you're having numerous children with a slave, it's convenient to espouse theism. I mean, I'm not putting Thomas Jefferson down. It's a known fact that he had two families. And you say, you're, you're out there defaming someone. No, that's just history. Okay, that's history. Right. We, that's what happened. We understand that. We, we've genetically proven that he had two families. If you want to live the way you want to live, theism is very convenient. But to know the creator of the universe is to espouse biblical Christianity and say, oh, Lord, you know my thoughts before I think. You know me better than I know me. Help me understand my own heart. Yeah. And you say, where are we going with this? It is just so wonderful to realize that God actually cares when you bless his name. Right. Why should he care? Why should he care that you give him the time of day? He cares. That's awesome. This New Testament teaches that not, God, not only that God so loved the world, but that God so loved you. He gave his only begotten son. Paul preached a Christ who died for the whole world, but he lived for a Christ who died for him. I'm going to say that again. Listen carefully. The Apostle Paul preached a Christ who died for the whole world, but he lived for a Christ who died for him. Look at Galatians 2.20. He says it right here in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved the whole world. No, who loved me and gave himself for me. You say, what's the point? You can go to church 
and believe everything that the Bible says and believe in that God out there. And you can get saved that way, and I'm not saying you can't, but when God is happy is when we make it so personal, you think you care about my thoughts and my day and whether I had a good day or a bad day. You care whether I'm reaching my destiny. You care about my kids and you care about everything that matters to me. And I want you to know, I understand you love me. Yeah. And you say, why does it matter? Because you'll never walk away from the one that you love like that. Yeah. The truth is that when you get to the end of your life and you look back, you'll have had many wonderful friends, but you'll never find a friend like Jesus. You will never find anybody who is more passionately interested in the details of your life than the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you walk, how could anybody ever, you know. King Saul in the Old Testament claimed to serve God, the God of Israel, but when it was inconvenient, he obeyed. God was not very real to him. He did as he pleased. But David, on the other hand, had an intensely personal relationship with God, and he was still pursuing him on his deathbed. Psalm, you know, he's the one who wrote Psalm 139. Oh Lord, you search me and know me. You will know when I sit down and when I raise up. You scrutinize my path. You know my words before I speak them. David understood yeah. that the Lord was fascinated with David. Mm -hmm. And because of that, David was fascinated with God. Go to Psalm 63. We're not going to be very long studying the word tonight. We're going to worship. Oh. And you say, why? Because when... I, I looked at my own life, and you know, I've been praying a lot and not thanking enough. You know we're supposed to thank Him and praise Him more than we pray? Pray once and then thank Him for the answer. And you know, that takes discipline, doesn't it? Uh, Reverend Adele de Gregor, who was our missionary in uh, Guatemala, and I refer to quite often, she wrote a little book about a vision she had. And in this vision, she saw, and you say, are visions biblical? You want to know who in the Bible had visions? All right? All right. Ezekiel had visions. All right. Isaiah had visions. I wrote this with a prophet today, and some of them have visions. Anyhow, in this vision, she saw an old-fashioned weight and a balance. And in the balance, one was way down and one was way high. And the Lord said, the heavy one are all your prayers. And the light one is all your praises and worship. He said, your answer will come when the worship and praises outweigh the prayers. Wow. And you know, for that reason, tonight we're just going to, after we pray for what's necessary, we're going to spend some time and just thank God. Just worship God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 63, look what David said. He said, oh God, you are my God. And he said, well, you know, no. there's something powerful about telling God, you are my Lord. You are my God. Because it's different than just being God. It, he, we know he's God, but he's not everybody's God. You are my God, and I shall seek thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. There's something really, really powerful about you telling God, I am thirsty for you. Yeah. I want more of you. I stand on record. Please put me down on record of saying that I want more of your holy presence in my life. Just like Tammy, everything you said, Tammy, was so in line with what we're ministering tonight. I thought, wow, I wonder if she, somebody backs through my notes. Because there's something about when, you know, you can just come before God and he floods you with himself. You know, your problems all of a sudden don't seem very big. Amen. The decisions you have seem really clear. God solves everything. He answers every question. That, and for that reason, David said, My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will praise you. We have a society that says, Go look for your real love. Oh my goodness. Guess what? You found me. In Jesus, you found me. You say, I'll find somebody that loves me more. Betcha. Betcha. And you say, is it okay to be married? Sure. If you're married, get married, fall in love with the one you got. Be happy. But just don't expect them to meet the needs only he can meet. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just telling everybody this, okay? Yeah. Because I, I wonder, I thought I was really upset with Gordon for not making me happy. And it's uh, funny, it occurred to me. <laughs> I haven't prayed much lately. You know, there's parts of your heart that only God can fill. Okay? Yeah. Verse 7. David said, you've been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. 
Now he, he was, where was he when he wrote the psalm? According, if you've got your Bible open, right under Psalm 63, he said when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Do you know why he's, the only time he lived in the wilderness of Judah when he was running for his life from Saul. This is not what you would call the happy period of David's life. Later on he was king for 30, 40 years, for 40 years. Well, it would be better to be king than running for your life, right? Yes. But look at what verse 7 says. He says, if you're with me in the shadow of your wings, I can just sing for joy. I'll have to be king before I can sing for joy. Oh, that spoke to somebody. Yeah. What you waiting on? What you waiting on? You say, well, if I get this, then I can sing for joy. No, if you're in the shadow of his wings, you can sing for joy tonight. Verse 8, my soul clings to you. Another version says, my soul follows hard after you. and Your right hand upholds me. The spirit of worship is our greatest safety in dangerous spiritual times. It smashes idolatry in our lives. We live in a nation filled with idols. And, you know, they don't have many statues of Buddha, but you have materialism, and you have, you know, a long list of things that people worship. Sex, people worship. Well, it's not really to be worshipped. It's not quite a part of married life, but it's not to be worshipped. All right? Look at 1 Timothy 4.1. Everybody say this, worship is my safe place. Worship is my safe place. Then you say, why do you need a safe place? This is why. It says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. Now this isn't trying to be negative. When they report on Ebola, I mean, it's crazy to be afraid of Ebola. It's very, okay. But when they report on Ebola, they're just trying to keep us informed, okay? They're stating a fact, right? Some two, two nurses have contracted it. Let's believe God they'll get better, okay? Amen. This, when Paul wrote this to Timothy, he wasn't trying to be negative. He was stating the fact that in the last days, dangerous times will come, okay? In 2 Timothy, he says the same thing. It's even clearer. 2 Timothy 3, 1, it says, But realize this is in the last days difficult. Some translations say dangerous times will come. Why? For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to Paris, ungrateful, unholy. Could this fit our age? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the mindset of the times. I mean, we, why do we take so many selfies? Uh -oh. <laughs> Maybe just for fun, but you just because, you know, it's just unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self control, brutal haters of good. So we, we know we live in dangerous spiritual times. It says treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. My goodness, if this doesn't describe our society, you know? Yeah. Verse 5 holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these. My question is in dangerous spiritual times, where do you find a rock of safety? It's in developing such an adoration for the Lord Himself that you are in a place of worship where his presence surrounds you, protects you, informs you, guides you, okay? And, and that's by being as fascinated with God as he is with you. One of the beautiful places, I just want to read a couple more scriptures on it. Everybody know that worship is some of the most valuable time you have, and it's very hard when you come home tonight, it would be lovely absolutely lovely to think that every one of us would carve out 20 minutes to worship God. Mm. Now, for most of us, that's a foreign thought. Until I started watching Norval Hayes in the spring, oh. I mean, I love God, but just to take 20 minutes and do nothing but love on Him and worship Him, hallelujah! I just yeah. didn't at home. That, that hadn't really, and then I began to realize, why not? Uh -huh. Why not? I make time to sit down and talk to my kids. You know why? Because I love them, and we, you know, we just like to have a few minutes in the day to keep up with each other. I know what's going on in their lives. They're worth it. Yeah. He's worth it. Uh, Look at John 13, verse 1. This is when Jesus did one of the most astounding things. He washed his disciples' feet. You know, why? Because they were dirty and hot and fire. And you love them. You see, your feet probably have been in shoes, but they were in sandals and they walk on long roads with animals and, you know. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Numerical standard that says that that phrase at the end, he loved them to the end, could best be described as he loved them to the uttermost. 
He loved way beyond what we could imagine. The Amplified puts it like this, and I really like the Amplified of this verse. It says, Now before the Passover feast began, Jesus knew and was fully aware that the time had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father. And as he had loved those who were, were, were his own in the world, he loved them to the last and to the highest degree. He's fascinated by you. He doesn't like you a lot. He adores you. He didn't just die for the world. He died for you because he likes you. And he said, does he know my faults? Yeah, he knows your faults. But he has great faith that you're going to overcome your faults and be perfect. You know, okay? This is good. Yeah. First, look at verses 3 to 5 here. <laughs> and Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from his supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. And then he poured water into the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. I grew up in a church, it was sort of a holiness church, where my, or at least my grandma did, where they had foot washing ceremonies. And you know, to be honest, it would be a very humbling thing for us to get down right now and say, guess what, I got a bunch of basins, we're going to wash each other's feet. It would be very humbling for us. Now in that church, they announced it months ahead, and everybody, they did, pedicures were unknown back then in Ohio. I never heard of going to a salon to get a pedicure, but everybody gave themselves their best pedicure. So when you went to wash somebody's feet, they'd already been washed five times that day. <laughs> my grandma would be sure that all the dirt was, honey, be sure my feet are clean, they're going to wash them tonight. And even then it was humbling. But you see, when Jesus, hey, they didn't have time to get the manure out that they stepped in. I mean, where have they got to wash their feet? They walked along with all the animals. That was a dirty, dirty road. And he washed dirty, dirty feet. And he got down there and lovingly, individually, if you were there, he would have washed your feet. Come on. That's God. Yeah. And he loves you that much. Does it make sense that we would love on him personally? Yeah. Yes. Did you know, you can say, but Pastor, we missed out on the foot washing ceremony. I have a question for you. A little Bible trivia here. Did you know that if you're one of those who are eagerly watching for his return, doing all you can to be ready for his return, that he's going to serve you just like he served them? Go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we're going to start in 35. Just three verses here. Jesus is speaking in Luke 12, 35. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Now, we talked about this the other night. Remember the ten virgins and five of them had oil and five of them didn't? What did the oil represent? Holy the Holy Spirit. And the ones whose lamps were burning were the ones who had the overflow of the Spirit. Remember Sunday night? Keep your lamps lit. That means have plenty. Have an overflow of the Spirit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Now what does that mean? It means we're to be preoccupied with being ready to meet the Lord. And by being that, I don't just mean for ourselves, but for helping other people. Our job here is to help other people get ready to meet Jesus, right? Wow. If we do that, look at what he promises us. 37. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve. Doesn't that sound like the Last Supper? He girded himself with a towel to wash their feet, but this time it's to serve with food, I guess. It says he will gird himself to serve, and he'll have them sit down at the table, recline at table. he got to come up and serve us, and you say, Pastor, that sounds blasphemous. I didn't write it, I just read it. Just like he waited on those disciples, he's going to wait on you and me. If we're that intensely interested. We have a God who adores us. And we don't spend near enough time adoring him. There is safety in worshiping God. This is supposed to be an eternally lo lo lifelong love affair. Now, just a couple more minutes. That's all we have. If our Lord takes such a vibrant, moment-to-moment -moment interest in us, what is our proper response to him? Where is our place of safety? We're right here in Luke 12. We'll go to Luke 7. You know this story, but this is not supposed to be the exception. This is supposed to be the norm. Right. I just finished a book last night 
I'm going to read your page in a minute. And it's about a guy who saw heaven. And I don't know if I'll put it in the bookstore. There, you know, it's, some things are hard to defend. You can't prove that he went, but I believe. But all the way up to the end, I believe it. And at the end, I really believe he went. And I'll tell you why. He was a reformed Dutch Christian from Michigan, a banker, very dignified, very formal, very, you know, ritualistic in their worship. But when he saw heaven and he didn't get to go in, he was at the gate and he could only look in, but he saw the throne a long ways away. He said, I saw grown men dancing with all their might before the Lord. And everybody had their hand raised. And then he said, "My speak now to my reformed brethren. I know what your doctrine says, but God likes dancing. And he said, we'll probably never dance down here on this earth. And I've never raised my hand in church yet as he wrote the book. But he said, one of these days I'm going to blow you away and raise my hands in church. You know why? Because it, in heaven, people are exuberant about God. A lot of us, we want heaven on earth right here and now, but we want to, don't want to act like they act in heaven. It's not that hard. Well, look at this lady. She acted a lot like heaven. Look, look, six, or, oh, 736. Now, one of the Pharisees, everybody say this is supposed to be the norm. Not the exception. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Anybody qualify? Yeah. Okay, it could be us. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is, and who is touching him that she is a sinner. The question was, Simon worshiping the Lord or judging the Lord? When you find yourself questioning and judging God, what do you know? You're in enormous spiritual danger. We're not here to question God and try to figure out where we think we're smarter than him. We're to worship. Hallelujah. Question about the lady. Did she have a personal relationship with Jesus? Was her love for him personal, obviously? Did she have any other gods before him? Was she in a place of great safety in her right standing? We could read all the rest where Jesus defended her. Do you see, when, when David danced before the ark, I think sometimes we think, well, maybe that was part show. No, that wasn't part show. He didn't know anybody was, that was there but God. Right. The time when you really get into worship is when you forget anybody there. You could care less who's there. You and Jesus are there. And you're worshiping God. And that is the greatest place of safety. The most powerful motivation for living godly Christian lives is knowing that one day, very soon, we will stand face to face with the one who loved us most tenderly, most compassionately, most patiently, and most passionately. You'll never go find somebody more patient with you than Jesus. <coughs> Or he's just this enthusiastic supporter of you. And we miss, we miss out on so much of his anointing and presence by not worshiping. When you come to the end of your journey and look back, you're going to have to be, have to admit, you will be compelled to admit that no one anywhere took a more personal, devoted, 24-7 interest in you than the Lord Jesus himself. Because the Lord's friendship with us is of a very personal nature. And the rest of my notes I just went on to list time after time when he was in a really, really busy place and like the widow of Nain, he would stop every, this whole life and raise her son from the dead. You know, I mean, one after another. He's, he's between the Garden of Gethsemane and the scourging post. And Peter cuts the guy's ear off. That's a very small thing compared to what he's going through and yet he stops and he heals one man's ear, Malthus's ear, because he loves so much. To close, I just want to read this little bit of the guy that saw heaven. And, um, you know, I came from a tradition where we were very, very respectful. I didn't mean we loved it, it just means we were trying to be respectful. This is what this guy, Mark Besterman, says. As my eyes eagerly swept over the panoramic view of heaven, soaking in the sight of endless wonders, eventually I beheld the throne. For God and his son are seated and will reign forever. The throne was about three quarters of a mile away and dazzlingly bright, lit with brilliant white lights. 
It's hard to imagine as I sit here in this dark earth remembering that in heaven my eyes could see much clearer and much farther away than down here. I saw huge white pillars surrounding the throne and an enormous crowd of people, men and women, boys and girls, dancing and singing along in a mass choir of praise to the two beings seated on it. Yes, I did say the men were dancing and their arms were raised in worship too. Some of my Dutch Christian Reformed friends are going to have a hard time imagining the imagining themselves dancing in worship or even raising their hands. All they have ever done in worship is to sit down, stand up, sit down, turn to page 54 in the blue book, which is a hymnal actually, but called a blue book. No matter how devoutly we love our God, raising one's hands in praise is unthinkable, even for me. One of these days I'm going to just give everyone in church fits and raise my hands high and let them think what they think. Isn't that amazing? Even after being to heaven, he hasn't raised his hands yet. Probably what they would think is good old Mark went to heaven and he can't help himself. Well, nobody is going to be able to help themselves at the foot of God's throne. Hallelujah. Worshiping the two beings I saw from a distance, exalting the holy ones with a purity and a joy we've never known. Yes, I saw two beings. Indescribable images, really, but they appeared to be two people sitting there, and I've always assumed that they were God and his son Jesus. How I would have loved to be closer, to see my heavenly father and this his son who died for me face to face. Even I can hardly believe was ahead for us in heaven. We'll experience life as we were meant to live it before the fall, without stress, pressure, negativity, fear, anxiety, sickness, and death. We'll never worry again about what people think of us, which means we'll do things that we never thought ourselves capable of here. And sorry, guys, but you're going to dance. And the strange thing is, you won't mind it one bit. Heaven is like that. In God's sinless home, you are finally free to live and happily serve your Lord in whatever is prepared for you. One time I was saying, Lord, I just want to be with you. What I meant was I want to come to heaven. I want to be with you. And finally, after saying that to him about ten times in a day, he said, well, then why don't you just be with me? <laughs> oh. You know what I mean? If I really, we can't be in heaven now, but we can worship now. Oh, yeah. We're just going to worship. I didn't know Nathan was going to be in here. Jeremy, is that Jeremy in here? Do you know how to do that new song, Boldly I Approach Your Throne? Let's do that one. And then whatever song, we're just going to give God some of the love that he showers on us. And you say, well, I'm not a worshiper. You'd be amazed at what comes. Hallelujah. Norval Hayes, when I started watching those videos in worship, he said, I dare you to worship God an hour a day and see what happens. And I started doing it. And within three days, the church received a $5,000 gift to the lender oh. the mortgage. He used to say, do you worship him for that? No, I worship him because he's so good. But you see... <laughs> When God, okay, remember Adele's vision? She saw her prayers were weighty, weighty, and her praises up here. And the Lord said, as soon as you can get the praises where they outweigh the prayers, you'll get your answer. I really think we've robbed God by just not loving on him like we should. Let's worship God. If you want to come down around the front, that's fine. Mm -hmm. 